Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Find more episodes and subscribe on your favorite platforms. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com. In today's conversation with Jen Ansbach, we talk about a number of things that she does with her students, including the use of mentor texts and support that she offers them through feedback and conferring. We also talk a little bit more about her mantra that they read every day, write every day, listen every day, and speak every day in order to lead a rich, integrated language arts life. Here's my conversation with Jen. Welcome to Writing Matters. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Jennifer Ansbach, who is an author and a teacher and currently a PhD student in American Studies. Welcome, Jen. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah. So thank you again so much. I know just in saying that you're a teacher, that makes you busy enough, but then you're a PhD student, which makes you even doubly busy. And then you are also a Heinemann author as well. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and and kind of how you got to this uh, current path that you're on in education and, and what has led you to this point. Oh, um, okay. Well, I was an English and American studies double major at Rutgers University um, as an undergraduate. And I really wanted to go for a PhD in American studies, uh, but it wasn't really feasible at that time. And uh, I was working at the mall and tutoring high school kids. Um, I was selling video games and I had drop in tutoring for high school kids. Um, so that they could buy their video games and then go home and play them and their homework was done. And my friend said that this was ridiculous because there would be high school kids lying all over the floor when she came in and she told me to just go back to school to be a teacher. So when I did that to pay the bills, um, I started, I had done some writing um, for my friends. Uh, He had a newspaper on Long Island um, and I'd done some column work for him. And um, I was working for our local paper here. And then I became a sports writer um, part-time for a sports magazine. And I covered the New York Rangers and Devils while I was going through school. And then my first couple years of teaching, in fact, um, I would teach all day and then go cover um, hockey games at night. So writing has always been part of what I did. um, And it was part of my path to becoming a teacher. And um, a couple years ago, I decided I still really wanted a PhD in American Studies, so I applied to Rutgers Newark, and I was fortunate enough that they accepted me into the program. So um, I'm a TA and um, a research assistant part-time and a part-time graduate student and a full-time teacher. So it's a lot, but there's a lot of writing in my life. Oh, absolutely. And so give us a, just a quick snapshot. What does day-to-day life look like for you? As a teacher, where are you at? Who are your students? What courses are you teaching? Um, I teach, uh, we just started this week. Yesterday, I met my students for the first time. So today was only our second day of school. I teach at a comprehensive high school, 9 to 12, um, in New Jersey. And um, this year, I'm teaching grades 9 and 10 right now. And then in the spring, I'll also teach a Um, an intro to film genres course, which is sometimes offered as dual enrollment credit with the community college. And so um, two days a week when I'm not teaching, I'm, um, I'm driving up to Newark and in between I'm using uh, my writing process in my classroom to show my kids how to be better writers. So um, it's a pretty middle-class diverse group of kids that I have. And some of them have families who are professionals and some of them have families that they're, they'll be the first to go to college. So I have a lot of opportunities to kind of mentor and model what those things look like. It's fantastic. And thank you for taking time out on the second day of school to do this recording. Very much appreciate it. So you are also the author of Take Charge of Your Teaching Evaluation, published by Heinemann. And it sounds like you might have a few other projects coming up that maybe we can touch base on at the end. So this season, uh, during the podcast episodes, we are trying to uh, hear about a tried and true writing lesson, something that you go to that works well for you and your students, and then to really step into your classroom and to hear 
um, what it sounds like, what it looks like, what it feels like when you and your students are in the midst of that lesson. So what, what's a tried and true lesson that works well for you and your students? Um, I, I wish I had a specific lesson that worked really well for writing all the time. I do find that it depends on the mix of students and individual personalities to find something that really resonates with them. But one of the things that I love to do is to do is to work with mentor texts and to let kids work on those. So, you know, when, sometimes I'll find a poem that just really resonates with kids or a paragraph that really resonates. And then as they're crafting their own versions, uh, as I walk around the room, you know, everybody's head is down and they're scribbling furiously and they're whispering to their neighbor because they're so excited to share. And you hear that authentic feedback like, oh, that's so cool. Or, oh, I, you should say more about that. So that for me is really exciting in those moments because using a mentor text um, really helps. And I, I use a sports metaphor with them that, you know, if you wanted to learn how to play basketball, um, you know, there are better people to help coach you on that than I am. But if you want to learn how to write, standing close to a professional and modeling what they do, as um, Kelly Gallagher talks about, that really does seem to make a difference. And then um, I just like when we get to pull the supports away and they start to discover how to make that writing their own. So, you know, they stand super close to that mentor text when we're starting and they're only changing a few words. Um, and that moment when you've done that enough that the spark is there and they've seen enough um, enough of their students, of, enough of the other students' work that they really appreciate how they can turn this into something totally new. Um, and those are my favorite moments of writing when they've, they've, something has resonated in a way that makes them want to write something of their own and share it. That's fantastic. So you just reminded me of one thing and then a follow-up question. The reminder was, you know, when you see the New York Times publish a headline about mentor texts and cite the National Writing Project, that's a happy day for an English teacher. I don't know if you caught that earlier this week. I, I didn't, unfortunately, because earlier this week I was sitting in meetings. Oh, no. Well, I will be sure uh, to share the link. Yeah, it's, it, you know what the first week of school is like. So oh, um, totally ours agree. comes after Labor Day. So it's just, you know, we've kind of, we bring up the rear. Uh, everybody has all, already been back for weeks and, you know, we're just getting back because summer is over here. Um, so unfortunately I haven't looked at anything because I had class after I had class at night and I had classes during the day and, Good. and in totally service. I understand. But, totally but understand. that, that whole, um, that whole idea of using mentor text, I think as it gets more widely spread, I think we'll have a lot more people using it. I know that I, um, I taught one of the history teachers in my school. He was really frustrated doing DBQs. And I said, well, did you give them a mentor text? And he looked at me like I was speaking in language he didn't know. And I was like, look, look. And so I went and got my materials and I showed him what his lesson could look like. And he immediately tried it and came back the next day and said, oh my gosh, those are the best DBQs I've ever seen. Um, so I think for a lot of teachers, if you're not using mentor texts, the, the leaps and bounds that that little bit of scaffolding can bring to kids, um, because it not only provides them, um, you know, this kind of framework, it provides confidence, it provides inspiration, um, and it's a model for guidance. So it really, for a lot of kids, even if they have a strong skill set, just makes them feel more confident in what they're expressing. I love using mentor texts. Awesome. Well, and I was going to ask maybe as a quick follow-up, is, is there any one uh, mentor text that sticks out uh, in recent memory that kids have really uh, enjoyed using? Um, I, we did some, some work on some dialogue poems where they described people in their lives that they care about using the language that they hear from that person. Um, and that was really powerful. Um, nice. having kids, you know, write the quotes, like, you know, their memories of what their grandmother said to them that was meaningful. Um, and sometimes they understand that those everyday things of wipe your feet before you come in my kitchen is, is part of that relationship, right? So, um, I found that that, because it's dialogue specifically, helps me teach voice, which is really kind of elusive sometimes for ninth grade writers. But they, when you give them 
when you tell them to use someone else's words um, so that it sounds like that person, they really start to make that connection and it really helps enhance their writing for the rest of the year. Fantastic. So as you're thinking about what it means right now for you to be a teacher of writing, uh, what are the key trends or issues or inquiries or things that are sparking your curiosity? Oh my goodness. Um, well, it's, I'm sure lots of people feel this way, but for me, reading and writing is so integrated. It's really hard to think of myself as a teacher of writing without thinking of myself as a teacher of, of literature and language. Um, so the, you know, I'm really interested right now, like I said, mentor texts and looking for mentor texts. Um, when I read Where the Crawdads Sing for the first time last year, I, I was just so enchanted by the, the language that I, all I could think was, oh my goodness, this is going to make such beautiful mentor text opportunities for my students. Um, so I'm constantly looking for that. Um, using digital feedback for students to speed up how much time it takes me to get back to them so that I can kind of automate, you know, with pre-made comments, I can automate some of the technical stuff that we're working on um, and pointing out like, you know, this is, <laughs> this is the comma splice we talked about. Um, this is a strong sentence. Um, being able to automate that so that I have more time to write the personal notes at the end more quickly so that they're getting that feedback more quickly is important to me. I've been working a lot more on um, improving my conferencing with students so that um, we're using a lot of oral language to talk about writing and using those skills um, to enhance how they're, how they're writing. Um, I find that sometimes a short conversation does a lot more than written feedback. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to attend, this is not an advertisement, I was fortunate enough to attend the Heinemann Literacy Retreat in June um, and nice. to learn how to do um, some new ideas on using readers and writers notebooks from Linda Reef and Penny Kittle. Um, what a gift that is. And so um, I'll be looking for new ways to integrate that and do some new things this year. Fantastic. If you don't mind, I'd be curious to hear just a little bit more about that digital feedback. Is there a particular tool or is that just something where you have like a bank of uh, comments that you, you hold in a, a Google Doc or a Word Doc and you copy and paste or what are you doing to, to make that process more efficient? Um, we have switched over to Google Classroom, and um, because I, I do everything to the extreme, I went and got my Google Certified Trainer <laughs> certificate so that I had more resources and I had more right. ability um, to help support students and other adults on the, on the journey. So right now, I'm just using it in Google Classroom and using, um, using those saved comments, because you do find sometimes if an assignment is similar that the comments, you know, if the goals, if you have a list of criteria that you're looking for kids to meet, then sometimes the comments are gonna be very similar. So being able to automate that um, for what we're focused on and have both the positive comments, like, you know, this is a strong example of this. This is a strong example of, you know, this other thing that we were working on, as well as, you know, pointing out where maybe they missed the mark and what they need to do to fix it. Um, that goes much quicker so that when I write the comment at the bottom or the top, you know, I usually just put a little comment box sometimes attached to their name where I write a note to them about, you know, um, I try to start off with my personal reaction, how I felt about reading it or how excited I was about it um, or how interesting it was. And I find that positive connection before I get into like what we need to do to improve this. Um, and I'm working really hard on focusing on giving feedback during the process and less on the end product. That's such a hard thing to get out of. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not useful at that point. It's not useful unless there's something else they can directly apply it to. Um, but, you know, if, we're, if we've spent three, we're three weeks on narrative writing and this is their polished final narrative writing piece, I think even for the student to just let the grade speak for itself and you know, whatever positive comment I put on there, like, you know, I, thank you for sharing this, I think is enough at that point, because you can talk a piece of writing to death, I think. Right. Well, it sounds to me, just to kind of summarize and reflect back what you were saying, like, in this process of providing the digital feedback quickly, focusing more on that conferring time, making sure that you're very intentional about that feedback during the process, 
And again, by relying on those mentor texts, it sounds like you found a new rhythm for the way that writing gets taught in your classroom. How, how are students feeling about that? Um, I th- so I think it depends on the student. I think that um, in my classroom, we read every day, we write every day, we listen every day, we speak every day. Um, we're doing all of those things um, because it's all connected. So it's, so for some of the students, it's a lot of writing because they, they're coming from a situation where maybe not as much um, production was expected. So the idea that we're writing every day for some kids, you know, some kids are coming from situations where they wrote in a notebook on Fridays or whatever. So this idea that we're doing it every day is a little bit overwhelming for them. Um, even if these are really short pieces that we start with that aren't being graded, and we're just, you know, sort of priming the pump for what comes next. But I think for the most part, um, using these tools this way where they feel like um, the feedback is coming back more quickly. Um, I was blessed last year. I had really small classes. I had a class of nine and a class of 14. Um, I can give a lot of feedback that way. Uh, My film classes, I had two sections of film last year um, for college credit. And I had a class of four and a class of six. I can give so much more feedback um, pretty quickly when there's that few students. This year I have classes that are closer to 20. Um, So I know having made, having got into that rhythm last year, I think is going to help me not be overwhelmed because the bottom line is the longer it takes for you to give that feedback to students, the harder it is for them to apply. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it, it ages very quickly, right? Every day that goes by, it's less useful. So I'm finding that that's a much better way for me. Great. And your students are clearly benefiting from it. And that's amazing to know that you've got that kind of uh, level of um, connection with them in that class size. I think when they are producing something that they've taken through a couple drafts and we've really talked about it and they were allowed to choose a topic, and they're picking something that they feel a real connection to, they are producing things that they are, they have more pride in. And I think that them taking, feeling proud of what they're creating and wanting to share it um, is really useful. We did digital projects for the end of our narrative unit last year, and they made digital projects about a day in their life or um, something similar, a day in the life of the high school or a day in their life. And they had a lot of options but some of the writing was just so poignant that they were um, using that opportunity to reflect back and do things that they were um, confident about sharing and, and excited about sharing. And I think that when kids understand that they're not writing for me, but they're writing for each other, or they're writing a piece that is a gift to a family member. Um, one, of, one of the boys last year wrote a, an amazing poem and because we'd been working on specific detail, um, he was describing his dad and described the drywall dust his father came home in, um, in a way that just was so touching in that it showed his, the way this boy sees his dad and the way he appreciates the hard work, right? So the hard work was implicit in that, but that he was really observational in seeing um, what that looked like instead of just saying, my dad works hard. Um, and being able to share that with his family so that they saw that he was proud of their hard work. Um, especially he was, a, um, his family uh, is a family of recent immigrants. So that was really important to him um, to be able to claim that space. That's amazing. And my guess is based on what you've said, chances are he might've learned that strategy from a mentor text and was able to adapt something that he saw and then, turn that into something really powerful for his own uh, writing and his own family. Absolutely. We had looked at many mentor texts. I believe that came out of the unit we used um, the house on Mango Street. And I think, um, I think our, for, for my school anyway, I know my Latinx students don't frequently feel like they're centered in the conversation or in the work or in the literature. And so to see themselves centered in that way, um, really was powerful in um, 
in their response and their eagerness to be part of a larger conversation that they felt like they were entering um, this adult space of writing instead of, you know, just doing a schoolwork assignment. Certainly. I really appreciate how you say that they're entering this larger dialogue, right? They're becoming part of this, you know, local, state, regional, national, international conversation as writers. That's so important. So earlier, I tried to pin you down with the one tried and true lesson. I'll try to pin you down <laughs> here again. Um, oh, okay, also, try. We'll try, we'll try. But we're really curious to hear like what the one go-to resource is. And I know you have a wealth of knowledge. You don't think I'm going to on recording say one tried and true <laughs> and are, you I lost know. your mind. I, I love know. my Heinemann family. Uh, okay. Uh, currently I'll tell you this um, currently we are um, my district is moving towards a readers and writers workshop model and I am helping pilot that at the high school it fits in with the way I've kind of always taught um, but we're doing it on a bigger scale so right now we're using um, Penny Kittle and Kelly Gallagher's 180 days but um, I will say that using 180 days if you haven't already used Write Beside Them or Write Like This, they're each of their other writing books, um, you, need that, you need that background knowledge of how to use a mentor text, I think, to make 180 days work. Fair enough. And all of the rest of us that are Heinemann authors, forgive you for <laughs> zeroing in on Penny and Kelly right now. <laughs> Not a problem at all. So. Fantastic. So as we kind of come to a close of this particular conversation, and I've always appreciated the way that you've interacted on Twitter and through conferences and other dialogues. So I know this is not the end of the conversation. It's just a pause okay. for now. Um, in this kind of broader sense, uh, what impact does writing have on your life? I know you already mentioned a little bit about your new role or relatively new role as a graduate student. Um, you're a teacher writer. You model writing for your own students. Uh, how would you describe who you are as a teacher writer and, and the effect that writing has on your personal and professional life? Well, first, I would say that um, at this juncture, I am a teacher of writing, a student of writing, um, and, and an author constantly. Um, and the ways in which those lines are getting blurred is really, really um, gratifying and sometimes really profound. Um, so I, a lot of times, because I'm in American studies, but my goal is um, to do work on young adult literature and social justice, um, American studies is an education. So I have a lot more flexibility in my methods. I have a lot more flexibility in what I'm submitting. Um, so some of the papers I'm writing, for example, are going are really um, drafts of journal articles, for example. And so when I'm when I'm working on those and I'm creating, for example, a synthesis grid to do my paper, um, and then I'm bringing that synthesis grid, which uh, my personal process is to use giant art paper. Um, like I have a giant art notebook that's like nine by 12. Um, and I, you know, I use, just grid it out um, on some drawing paper with a flare pen. And so it's got columns because I can't handle index cards and sticky notes would be too many. Um, and so I make columns and then I'm, it's a synthesis grid, right? So it's, um, how these different ideas are being explored or argued in these different texts. And then I take it to school and I show my students these big pieces of art paper where I've done all this work, which they're like, we don't have to do that much, do we? Um, but last year when I was teaching my college dual enrollment class to show my students the, the synthesis grids I was trying to teach them how to make, um, and they saw that it was something that I was actually using, and then I would bring in, you know, my um, second to last draft that has all of my comments all over it because I'm still revising and I get to share with them how I'm doing this writing as a student, but it's also intended for publication in a larger audience than just my professor um, and showing them how that works in my life helps me model for them some very, very real ways um, that writing becomes part of your life. 
you know, so a lot of times I'll say to them like, oh, that's a really great idea. Let me jot that idea down. I think I might want to explore that more later. I think that that's a really interesting idea there. Um, so for me, it, it's a constant blending. Um, I did feel bad that I brought my, <laughs> I brought my synthesis grids into one of my graduate classes um, when the papers were due and one of the other students said, wait, where did you learn how to do that? And I just looked at him like, well, I, I, te I teach writing during the day, so. Uh, <laughs> it's like, my day job. <laughs> that's, like, that's what I do. And then I felt bad, right? Because this guy is graduating from college and no one has shown him how to make a synthesis grid. Um, you know, so then I went home, went, went back to school and told my students how lucky they were <laughs> that they knew what a yeah. synthesis grid was. Um, but it's, it's really, um, it's, I'm incredibly blessed at this point that, um, I have opportunities and um, that my interests align with things that other people think are interesting and that they let me do these things. Um, I'm taking a feminist uh, history and theory class this fall that I know I'm going to be doing two, uh, I think two, there should be two journal articles that come out of this um, where I'm applying these ideas to some contemporary um, young adult fiction to show how these how, to talk about representation and social justice issues. So that's really exciting, right? Because I'm going to turn around and go back to my classroom with those same books and those same ideas and share it with kids. So. Well, and what's amazing to hear is that you, you go into this writing process very intentional with, with the idea. And I mean, this in all the best ways of like double or triple dipping on any one of these projects, like, you're doing this and then this is building into something bigger and then it's building into something bigger. And I think as we think about student writers, they so often just go from assignment to assignment from class to class and, and they don't have that opportunity to dream bigger about who they can be as writers. And it sounds to me like you're really modeling that for your students, which is just an incredible gift. So thank you for well, your ability to do that. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, um, I'm really fortunate and I, I do have some colleagues in the history department and we are really working to try to convince um, administration to let us do more collaboration together so that um, if they were teaching American history and I was teaching American literature, that we could really do some cross-curricular um, interdisciplinary things, which because my background is American studies, that's just how I conceive of the world is in this non-siloed interdisciplinary way. Um, I think that, that that would be a tremendous opportunity to be able to do those kinds of things and show kids um, how they can do things. And as far as being intentional about double and triple dipping, it's really the only way I can get my life in order is right. if one thing counts for three things and I can check off three things. Um, but I'm really excited about what I do and I'm so fortunate that um, I have these opportunities and again that that people are interested in things that I'm interested in because if no one else is interested in what you're interested in and you can't find a way to make them interested it's a really lonely conversation indeed well thank you so much Jen for being our guest today on writing matters well thank you so much Troy I appreciate this opportunity and it's always good to talk to you writing matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast Discover more episodes and subscribe on your favorite streaming platforms. Or check out filmed episodes on YouTube. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com.